education and what, what that means, but uh, during my tenure here, this has never occurred. So it was mentioned that this is something we ought to check in and do, and we have a long uh, storied history and relationship with Bernstein Shore. And this evening we do have uh, three members from the uh, municipal division. I'm not sure what you call it. Municipal and governmental right. services. There you go. <laughs> So perhaps I'll just turn it over to Phil Sasche and Phil can introduce his colleagues. Excellent. Thanks. Hi, my name is Phil Saucier, um, and I'm the chair of our Municipal and Governmental Services uh, Practice Group at Bernstein Shore. And uh, to my left is Pat Skelly, who's our CEO and former chair of our department. So we have a municipal lawyer as CEO, which from our department's perspective is a, is a good thing. And then Shauna Mueller is one of my colleagues in the municipal department. And she is a uh, general town attorney, but also specializes in finance and TIF matters. Um, so that's our team. And do you know me just go, uh, sort of an overview of our work with the town? And yeah. Um, so if you can give, um, so where this is the first time that I mean, the policy is 13 years old, 14 years old, and we've never really yeah. Yeah. followed it. So if you can give maybe a historical perspective to your knowledge, you know, kind of how the relationship got started to your best of your information, sure. and then where it's going. So for the best of what I was able to track down sure. yeah. is um, we've been able to track a relationship to it around 1969 or at least 1969. Um, and one of our namesakes, Barney Shore, was a municipal lawyer. And so I always like to say municipal law is a sort of within the DNA of our firm. It's one of our, our longstanding practice groups. And Barney Shore had a new associate at that time named Paul Frinsco, who later became one of the deans of municipal law in Maine and who just fi uh, formally retired about a year ago from our firm. Um, Barney and, from my understanding, talking to Paul, Barney and Paul um, uh, started working with the town around 1969, and Paul uh, then quickly became the town attorney. So sort of Barney turned over the relationship to Paul, and, and Paul really worked with the town for probably 25 or 30 years directly. Um, and a lot of good stories he has in terms of as this town has grown over the years, and our firm's relationship with it from the building of this town hall. There's some interesting stories about that. Um, to a number of the TIF districts in town and um, obviously the racetrack and, and uh, you, you name the issue, our firm has likely been involved in it since around that time. It should be noted yeah. that 1969 was the year that we changed former government to the council yep. manager form in our first charter and I, I'm quite sure that, um, that Bernsey Shore was, was pivotal in the creation of the charter and getting us set up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And creating the sewer district as well at one point. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was actually on another road issue. I was helping probably four or five years ago, and I, saw, I had to track the minutes. And you saw Barney and Paul's name in a town meeting form of government minutes. <coughs> and then three months later, it was the town council accepting the road, and Paul was also at that meeting in 1971, <laughs> um, uh, 1970. So it's um, so been around for a very long time. Um, and then after Paul, a number of, uh, again, I consider them deans of municipal on Maine who have now since retired. Jeff Hole has worked with the town over the years and he's still up counsel to, to our firm. And then Chris Van Yotis, yeah. that's probably your longtime attor town attorney, you, you might remember. I remember him, yeah. Uh, retired three years ago, but is also still of counsel, active, uh, I think of him as active of counsel. He, I consult with him frequently. He's a great resource, particularly on historical issues related to our, our longstanding communities. Um, and I, I stepped in as sort of the lead manager, we would call it, or your town attorney, um, about seven months ago or so. I've been working with, with the town for about six years, ever since I joined the firm um, from our practice. So. Bill drew the short straw. It's like being it's like being on that asteroid in Armageddon. <laughs> yeah. And it, either of you either of you have anything to add? That's sort of you know where the sort of background I think sure. up to this point. I mean, one thing I would just add is that I think probably I would say in the, over the last decade there's been a shift in the way our firm practices municipal law away from um, having all the legal issues de dealt with and handled by your town attorney, your one individual. And just the world is an increasingly complex place and it is important for us to be able to provide specialty services in a broader array of, of topics today than it ever was. And so, for example, you're not going to have um, Phil do your bond work because I'm the one that goes to the national conferences and trains on those issues. And so, so anyway, that, that's a shift I think that over the last decade you will have seen and, and has really worked well for us and our clients, I think. 
Absolutely. I, the only thing I would add from my position, I, I was in our municipal practice actively in it for over 30 years, um, worked with the town of Scarborough during many of the years where both Paul and Chris Vaniotis were the lead uh, lawyers in the relationship. But um, our municipal practice is a very, has been historically the largest in the state in terms of the number of communities that we represent and the number of lawyers who are experts in municipal law. And we're still very much in, in 2016 committed to this practice uh, as a law firm and committed to the uh, success of, of the group of lawyers, the today's group of lawyers who are really heading up this practice, including Phil and Shauna. Um, we have a large number of communities that we represent as general counsel and an even larger number of communities where we are a special counsel and we come in and do their bond work or we do some other specialized work. But I, what I just want to underscore is this particular relationship is one of the most important, longest term relationships that our law firm has with any client, uh, public or private. And so it's very important to us. We're committed to it. And we certainly want to be doing everything we can do to make sure that um, you all are satisfied with your legal services and that we're being as responsive as we possibly can be. So I'm going to ask maybe the, the, um, the one question in which, um, thankfully, or at least I'm hoping we're not going to get charged by the word. Um, <laughs> can you, well, no, it, because it's an opinion. So the question I have, and I think this is really the underlying tone of why maybe the um, policy was originally adopted. I was on the council, just got on the council when that happened. But um, what is the important, because there's um, this misnomer maybe, or this theory that, well, if you stay, keep your relationship with one entity for too long, um, there's a, there could be a tendency for um, a degradation of rel the relationship because things are taken for granted. Um, there's really no challenge to the advice that might be given. You know, you can exponentially take that out to different areas. So could you explain, you know, maybe why a relationship that spans 55 years? At least 46, yeah. 46, sorry. Wasn't doing the math. <laughs> they needed the calculator or Ruth to tell me how much it was. <laughs> Uh, 46 years, um, you know, why that's important to maintain that type of relationship Yeah, and just over? to build upon what yeah. Pat said, I think, um, well, a couple, I have a couple different answers to that. One is we, we really do see ourselves as um, municipal law is one of our f practice areas in the state that we really want to be the best at. And so it's very important that we remain responsive to our clients, um, regardless of if we've represented them for one year or 46 years. I can tell you personally, I would never take that kind of relationship for granted. And also... In my role, I'm actually relatively new to Scarborough. I've only been working with your community for about six years, and I'm at a point in my career where that certainly would not be an advantage for me to take it for granted at mm -hmm. all. I, I see Scarborough as my personal, most you know, one of my personal most important clients, in addition to our firm's most important clients. I also think there's a benefit to staying with a firm this long or being with a firm this long in the sense of the historic um, nature of our the records we have, our relationships, the fact that we can still pull upon. Um, Chris and Jeff and Paul in certain circumstances, I still talk with Chris frequently, which saves an inordinate amount of time and work if I was to have to recreate the wheel on certain things. Sometimes I'll say, to, you know, I'll get a question from Tom or something, and I'll, I'm often able to just do it myself. But if there's something I know because I've worked with Chris or I have our files that, oh, we worked on that about 15 years ago, uh, that similar issue, and, I, and I, can, I can talk with Chris, I can go look at our files and say, okay, that's what the issue was, and start from scratch. I think you, you get a yeah. benefit from that in that relationship. And, and I think to summarize that, yeah. in this community, um, it's sa the relationship saves us money. Yeah. The other thing I'll just add, you know, a, a practice the size of Burst and Shure, they have all sorts of clients all over the state. And very often, you know, with one degree separation in Maine, there's often mm -hmm. conflicts uh, that, that arise given the, just the breadth and, and the scope of their representation throughout the ages. The one good thing about our long-standing relationship was we often get kind of preferential treatment I've found that they have a duty to disclose a potential conflict, which they do, but more often than not, we get the benefit end of that. Uh, that um, so that really has not been a barrier, whereas uh, I could see that being a problem with other firms, yeah. given your size. That's absolutely right, yeah. So um, I, I just got a, a couple quick questions. Um, I'm looking at... Um, um, one of the, the letters from, from the firm here laying out the different categories um, and the year-to-date billing. Um, the categories seem very general, of, yeah. of course, and very all-encompassing. Is there a certain aspect 
of municipal law that we that we that you don't practice that we should be looking outside with or, or is it pretty much as you mentioned it could be specialized to specific issues like bonding or just general municipal practice yeah I, is there something or, or a service that you you don't offer that maybe we should be looking at outside or? I think the value we bring is that we do think we offer everything mm -hmm. so we're a full service law firm okay. and within our practice group itself we've decided and this is something that Shauna was mentioning we've begun to specialize over the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. So I specialize in land use and election law and a couple other issues, Shauna's finance and others. We're all both town attorneys. Ta uh, Shauna's the town attorney for a number of communities yourself. So we all are general uh, municipal practitioners. We have specialties. But because we're a full service law firm, if we do have issues that Shauna and I or Mary or other municipal colleagues don't, don't practice, we have the resources inside. So we've had our colleague Josh Silver who, who does IT issues we actually, I think, for even Scarborough. Yeah, uh, I don't know if, Tom, you re recall this, but a few years ago you were looking at contracting with an entity about some, um, um, I think it was credit card services. Mm -hmm. And, it, I, you know, I took one look at the document and I said, you know what, I need to call Josh. And it, it saves, that saves the town money because I don't spend three hours getting up to speed on something I've never seen before. And Josh can spend half an hour and, and give your town manager the mm -hmm. advice that he needs to make the informed decision. Sure. If we look back, you know, when I was chair of the municipal group about, about 10 years ago, we started very intentionally encouraging our younger lawyers, including Phil and Shauna, to start finding the areas where they could have deeper expertise. Uh, in the old days, in the days of Barney Schur and, and Paul Frensko and even Chris Van Otis, the, the appointed municipal lawyer for a community often tried to do it all, tried to yep. do everything. And as Phil said, it's really hard to do that. And we found that it was in the interest of the town and in, in the interest of the lawyers to draw upon the depth of the larger firm that we have so that we've got areas of specialization and even outside of our municipal group, you know, we've got 110 lawyers in three offices, um, and there's depth in almost everything. So if if a if there's a bankruptcy and it's and and it's affecting your ability to to collect real estate property taxes on a piece of parcel because of the pendency of the, of the bankruptcy, we know we can go to Sam Anderson in our bankruptcy department and and get the assistance we need to make sure that we get through that process and that the town's interests are are preserved. If there's a complicated real estate transaction, back in the day Jeff Hole would have done it. Uh, today we have, you know, one of the partners in our real estate practice group who really understands that particular kind of track transaction to handle it. So letting, you know, it's still important to have these primary relationships like these two folks here, but to also have the town know and have the manager know that where you need that extra depth, there's somebody behind them that can provide that specific service. Yeah, I should mention, about a year ago, I had a meeting with at least Phil and Pat, and I'm not sure if anyone else is part of that, really just to sort out uh, with the transition from Chris, uh, Rob Crawford filled in for a bit, and then Phil stepped in, as he said, seven or eight months ago. Yeah, summer. I just want to make sure that I and my staff, lead staff that's authorized to contact the town attorney, understood you know, where that point of con who that point of contact mm -hmm. is. And so sure. it was helpful to uh, have that conversation, sort that out, and... You know, Phil is really the first call for almost everything, but for a couple of unique specialties, Shauna is the one on finance stuff. But everything else kind of goes through Phil and might get farmed out uh, yep. beyond him, but it's important to have it come and go through kind of one spot, and it's been helpful to get that Good. clarified. Good. So uh, I, just a, a couple more follow-up questions, if I could. Um, I noticed there's a... There's a um, a very long list of attorneys in here with varying um, hourly rates. And I'm not sure how our contract is necessarily worded. I think part of our review is to is to look at it, obviously, from the financial standpoint. We, the, the, the services you've billed for this year are, are, are pretty extensive, <laughs> obviously, for obvious reasons. Um, so the question I have is just from my understanding, and I'm not sure how the contract is structured with, with your group. Is it a... Uh, as needed basis, uh, 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 an hourly rate, depending on how it's needed. Is there a set rate that we've agreed to, or is there, you know, if you've if you're calling in a bond expert, let's say at two hundred and eighty dollars an hour, but the general attorney rate is two twenty-five. How how does that work with our with our town? Is it just a 
hours billed and it is what it is? It is. It's an okay. We have an hourly rate. I don't know if we actually have a form. I, we, I can say we don't have a formal, formal contract. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think given the long-term relationship of the, of, the, uh, of the relationship, we've sort of gone from year to year. So we yep. bill on an hourly rate. We always say to our, uh, we're, we're willing to discuss alternative billing arrangements. But um, we've traditionally in, uh, have billed, um, I think, so bond, I think, is the one area, right, that you bill somewhat differently for bonds, but everything else is um, hourly. And we have our hourly rates that have our general year-to-year -year, um, you know, cost increase. Typically, when we set rates and we look at them, you know, as a, as a firm, we look at them every year. Mm -hmm. But typically, we try to make sure that our rates for public clients are reflective of the fact that they're public clients, mm -hmm. which is not yeah. to say that they're cheap, because right. we're expensive and we recognize that. But, mm -hmm. but um, we do try to recognize that, that there is cost sensitivity for public clients and, and factor that into how we, how we set those prices. So those rates, I would assume, are, are for every municipality, They're not special or endemic just to Scarborough, they're for, that's your general published rate. What I, that's my general municipal rate, yeah, gotcha. and it okay. actually goes, you know, it changes year to year, yep. but that was what it was then. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the question I have is more, um, Two things um, before I forget, and I can not to go off on tangent, Tom. Mm -hmm. Based on the year-to-year -year nature, um, outside of this conversation, maybe the council and this committee can talk about whether this is a policy that needs to be retained or modified, uh, because it seems that it might not be given the relationship. So, if you can remind me later on that one. The question, I guess, so um, one is related to the bonding piece because we actually have our bonding agent uh, coming in at the next meeting to talk about that. So are you our counsel? So when we go out to bond and we're looking at, because um, I have more questions about the bonding side than really for you, um, So, but you're, you're part of that team that looks at the bonds to make sure that they're structured. Um, I mean, I, I kind of uh, come into that process later than your financial advisor does. I mean, okay. usually he's the one helping structure in, with Ruth, you know, what the amount is going to be, what projects you're really ready to do, and what the term um, of the repayment schedule should be, and, and really how that should go out to market, because yeah. um, that's his specialty. And my role is to come in and make sure that you're complying with internal revenue code, you're complying yeah. with the securities regulations that apply to municipal bonds, and that you've properly authorized them because my legal opinion is requi a required component to actually issue the bonds. So um, so that's that's really my role in, in the process. Okay. So the, the, I guess the, uh, the question that goes into that is not just really about the bonds, but it's really about any activity. So as an example, when we go through our audit, yeah. Um, accounting, the, the auditors come in, they actually send us a letter that says, can you please provide any concerns that you have or any known risk or unknown risk that you think that there's a potential for. And then during the audit, um, although I haven't really seen it, I've been, I've, in a nonprofit situation, I've been, um, management has to leave the room. Auditors will then share off the record or at least outside of management any concerns that they have. In legal services, it doesn't seem that there's any that type of relationship. So. Who's protecting, I mean, it's not really, nothing against you, Tom, yep. but, you know, who's, um, who's protecting the foxhole? Because if the manager comes to you with the craziest of ideas, um, without, and we may, know, we may or may not know about it, um, is there a legal obligation for you to then come to the council on your own and say, um, in confidentiality, mm -hmm. you know, we have concerns about the relationship or decisions that are being made? Do you kind of see where I'm going with that kind of with question? With respect to bonds in particular? or Well, any type financial? of advice, but especially mm -hmm. bonds. Um, yeah. You know, any type of relationship issues with that. And I've got a, a deeper understanding around that. But, I mean, it's really about any legal question, not just bonds, any, mm -hmm. anything. It's, it's an important question. The real yeah. question is who's, who's, the, who's client? the client? Who's the right. Client? Yeah. The client I mean, is, is, it, is it? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. you know, and then what if we had a rogue manager that said, no, you're not going to the council because I'm making the decision. I'm the administrator for the town. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so where do you step in and kind of go beyond that to, to make sure that we know or that we're protected? Well, I mean, we do need to remember that the town is who we represent. So if we yeah. have knowledge that a manager or a staff person is doing something that's outside the law that the council needs to know about, I think Phil would, would be in touch with, with the chair um, of your council. 
The bond piece is a little bit different because in um, the issuance of a bond, I'm asked to issue a legal opinion from our law firm that's supposed to be an independent opinion and not sort of yeah. just to facilitate the deal getting done, that everything was done proper and according to law. So if there's a problem with that process, I have to say something about it or I'm putting my law firm at risk. So. Um, and I have a question along the two. Are you looking at it from our compliance perspective or from the whole package compliance perspective? So let's say if there's an issue on the, the bond agent's side that we are maybe not be aware of, are you reviewing the entire deal or just looking at it from the perspective of the town saying your obligation as a town is to do X, Y, and Z, you've met that obligation, the bond agent Mm. has their own obligations to meet and we're not looking at that or are you looking at the whole package? Uh, my obligation is to look at the compliance of the town okay. in the process. Okay. Um, there are ways to make sure, you know, for example, your financial advisor has the right certifications and things like that and, um, it, and if I came to know about any problems, I'd certainly let you know. Sure, but, sure. Um, but at the same time, that is not going to end up being a legal problem for the mm. town. If it was, then I would, ha you know, look at it from that perspective. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And to clear, so it's logically, you're not evaluating whether it's the right decision to go out and bond. You're looking at only whether or not we have complied with all of the regulations regarding the bonding, um, including approvals and authorizations. And I mean, that's certainly true um, in a strict way of looking at it. However, um, working with the town over the years, I'm yeah. going to be able to contribute to some of those more policy type <coughs> questions yep. um, if if I feel like it's appropriate I think I'd offer that um, feedback to Ruth and Tom but um, but certainly my role as legal counsel is is to just make sure that you're following the laws so if there's an issue with the terms and conditions or the repayment schedule or something like that from our perspective mm -hmm. would that be something that you would necessarily look at and say you know look this this um, this term of payment is is a little bit out of the norm mm -hmm. and advise on that or would it be just something like saying okay you've you've we've made our obligation in terms of filling out the compliance and paperwork sheet you're fine terms and conditions are your issues to if, if that's what the manager determines as as his prerogative if that's the the length or say we want to come into that's not really something you'd comment on or um, if it's really out of whack and I can see it from a paper I would say something you know, okay. if you're gonna yep. try and repay something that's gonna last you five years over 15 I'm gonna say something to yeah you, but well, okay yeah. yeah the other thing is just uh, the marketplace keeps us in check and balance we do typically competitive bond sale and so mm -hmm. I assure you everyone submitting bids are scrutinizing the deal sure oh yeah they see yeah, something sure. awry we're gonna see it in exorbitant rates they, yeah. or Right. Or they're just they buy it, they hedge pay. it, and they don't want, you know, yeah, it's, it's yeah. so regulated now, even it's worse. Yeah. Of having, you know, solid four, five, six, very competitive bids, tightly packed. Yeah. So it all, that suggests to me that the, the package is good, yeah. that it's yeah. competitive. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the other thing um, that just in the bond world, since we're on the topic and I get to have my uh, yeah. time here, but, um, but the IRS and the SEC have upped their enforcement in the last yeah. few years okay. in a very substantial way. So... Um, so everyone who's in on the deal has more at risk in making a mistake, um, the underwriters in particular. So okay. everyone, everyone's paying pretty close attention now, including me. Mm -hmm. John, your, your question is very good. It's the, 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 the bond council representation is probably the clearest, simplest answer right. to the question. Yeah. It, it does get murky yeah. as to who the client is, depending on the issue, whether it's staff, whether it's a manager, whether it's a council, whether it's right. a group of residents. Uh, there can be overlap and interplay. At the end of the day, it's the town. Mm -hmm. It's the right. town. Yeah. It, the town is always the <clears throat> client, but but and in a lot of communities, the the manager is the principal day to day point of contact between the law firm and the and, and the town. And I think for for all of us as lawyers over the years, you have to be very sensitive to the fact that while the person who's calling you asking you to do the project is the manager, your client is the town. And, and certainly to the extent that you have an obligation uh, yeah. to anyone, it's to the town. And, and the council is a legislative body of the town, and that's you know, ultimately where the responsibility, yeah. where the responsibility lies. And um, by no means, um, in my, and I've been, like I mentioned, I've been around since 2002. I don't think, I'm, I'm actually now remembering how and why this happened. And so that will be something else. Um, but I think that um, when you think, uh, when you hear about other communities that are challenged today, um, uh, coastal Maine, um, I'm thinking of one community that where you, 
uh, Manager Hall came from. Um, there's that questionable relationship between the town's attorney, the town manager, and then the town council or the selectmen, in which there is like you know who can speak and for the town and where do you get the advice and who can ask the attorneys and um, we had, don't have that relationship issue, but it's always nice to at least understand it. Yeah, so. it's always said when we, we start working with the community for the first time, or maybe there's a turnover. Yeah, is to have that of who the contact. You see it a lot more in like the board of selectmen level, where they're also the administrators of the town. But yeah, that's very important to understand is the authority to talk with us. Yeah. Um, obviously, we, it's not a problem in this community. It's a well established. Yeah. line of communication but. so ba based on the memo and it is a little dated uh, and I'm doing a very rough math and rounding it's about two hundred thousand dollars a year at least this past year for legal services in comparison to um, you know our peer group generally speaking without getting into who yeah everybody I mean is that reasonable I mean we live in a litigious society um, everyone sues everyone and Scarborough seems to be um, just as uh, uh, subject to that, particularly in the past <laughs> couple of years. Is, is that comparable to other communities and what they're facing with? Uh... Well, I, and I actually just provided an updated um, numbers to Tom, so okay. I'll circulate that to you. And you're right, it's just over 200,000 yeah. for last year. It was a high year for you. Oh, OK. Yep. Um, there's no doubt about it. And, and that is partly because of uh, specific appeals that you have going mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. um, that have been longstanding and were complicated and went through the law court. I think that's significant. I think uh, I actually did the percentage that was at least uh, 35 percent oh, yeah. oh, okay. for the tax appeals mm -hmm. alone. And there are a couple other discrete issues that I think occurred during the last year that uh, won't occur every year. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt about it that it was a, a high year. But I think it's for specific reasons. You know, barring anything, you know, you'd expect that to go down. The tax year. appeal. Yeah. yeah. They, that's 35 percent. The whole um, um, one, those beachfront. Two or, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, in comparison, though, um, are other communities faced with more challenges because they're citizenry or whoever is impacted are they are they also facing greater litigation as a result or is it this just an anomaly for scarborough for this past couple of years as a result you know it's really hard to say it, it things you know i haven't been doing this as long as pat but you really see things go up and down and there are certain hot hot button issues that hit a community um yeah. you know a development issue or a tax issue or something that all of a sudden you know the legal services go way up and then go right. back and then they're quiet for five five years and right. yeah. You know, it's very hard to predict that. Um, I think Scarborough, with the exception of you know a couple, you know these couple issues from last year, are pretty steady. I mean, it'd be interesting to see the the numbers. Yeah. You know, over the last ten years or something, I mean, pretty steady. This has clearly been an up year. But you know, in, in the tech, property tax area, for example, yeah, if you're a coastal community, you're going to be much more subject to to oh yeah to issues related to valuation just because of the impact that revaluation has on yeah. right. on coastal properties. But likewise, if you're you know if you're a, a town with a single very large industrial yeah. um, taxpayer, um, you're going to be subject periodically, especially with changes in the economy that affect the viability of plants, to tax disputes. And the same is true in in other er in other substantive areas in land use, for example. Depending on what's happening in the economy, you can have stretches where everybody's trying to build something, and, and maybe and not always in the best places, and you get land use appeals going on. And then things change, uh, and and that stuff dies down. And yeah, so actually, compared to some communities, Scarborough is not as litigious in terms of the land use. So you have some of our communities where every variance and every development is, is goes through an ADB, and actually that's been fairly quiet here. Um, you've had uh, the last year or two. I guess that's kind of from my perspective. Yeah. Is there something that we that we are we doing something from a policy standpoint or a perspective that's causing our exposing us to more litigation risk or? More so than another community. I, my perspective is it doesn't seem to be. Um, we seem to be pretty, pretty. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I routinely tell, and I haven't told Thomas routinely, this is a very well run town. We get to see a lot of towns. Yep. yep. And I think the, the, the staff mm -hmm. here are excellent and very professional. I work a lot with the planning office and the yep. codes office and the clerk's office. And, you know, it's, I think it's unparalleled. So I think you have a very good staff here, and, and that's obviously very helpful in the terms of quality of work, um, which reduces your litigation risks. Yep. Um, that's Just what one saying. observation, you know, these things come and go. We've got a, a number of fairly costly um, code, code issues. Mm -hmm. We've dealt with one on mm -hmm. Parker Plain. We have another yep. one on Aslan Drive down here. Those will go away and not yep. likely to return. The tax appeals we've spoken about. But the whole uh, FOIA laws have created yep. a whole new 
workload for us and a lot of legal questions. That's right. So very often, although it's getting better, Toadie is the public information officer, very often we'll have to, and I encourage her to seek advice upon yeah. receipt of one just to understand how to respond. She knows how to follow the law, but they take all shapes and forms and sizes. Uh, the law provides for some exceptions, and all of that needs to be run through legal counsel. So that's a, it's a whole new yeah, cottage industry, if you will, that um, mm. five years ago didn't exist, frankly. Are there any, um, sorry. <laughs> Are there, uh, regarding FOIA, are there, uh, based on the complexity of it, are there any trends in which that you see out there where the legislature or um, the system might be changing to um, modify the FOIA laws? You know, somewhat. There's a Freedom of Access Advisory Committee that meets, yep. and they recommend changes annually. So I follow those for the firm. I'm one of the FOIA um, uh, designees for the firm. and. You know, they tried last year, actually, they put a mechanism in there for, I can't remember the word they used, Tom, but essentially nuisance, uh, nuisance, nuisance. Uh, which did something. I don't think it did as much as uh, the original sponsor wanted it to do, but it allows you to go and essentially ask the court to sort of stop um, anyone, uh, certain people from asking for more. But generally, I think the, the committee um, and the, the uh, Judiciary Committee, which reviews those bills, are actually more, are opening the laws more, quite frankly. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> and I think there's a, you know, the law's written in a way that, you know, public access is, is, uh, is the way we want to go. Yeah. So I think what we've actually seen is broadening of, of the law and, um, you know, allowing more appeal periods and uh, more requirements on staff. It's getting ex more and more expensive, I think. Um, so. But they, you know, it, there's a, a municipal uh, municipal representative on that advisory committee from the MMA. I think sits on that position right now. Mm -hmm. So those voices get heard. But it's the, you know, journalists are represented and, and mm -hmm. state government. I, I just want to circle back one thing. I, was, I, I misspoke when I said, "Is my rate for everyone?" I, I, I'm town attorney for I think nine towns now. We represent over 50 as general counsel. I can think of one right now. We have a, a different arrangement. My rate's slightly different. Okay. But generally, my rate is, is I call it my general municipal rate, and I yep. apply it to everyone yep. else. So I, and just get, sorry, sorry. Um, my kind of last question to circle around, and the breakdown of, of costs I think is fairly self-explanatory. Could you elaborate on what goes into general administration charges? Yeah, and, but, and these categories, by the way, were sort of made up for the purpose of this mm -hmm. memo, and my yep. colleague Chris Vaniotis had written a similar memo about 10 years ago. Okay. And when I talked to Tom, <coughs> I just followed those, but sure. I can tell you what I put in there. Sure. Um, and these are what I consider the day-to-day -day work I do with Tom and staff. So um, FOA issues are in that category. I didn't break that down for this purpose. Yep. But if you see below the memo, I actually have more specific. Oh, okay. All right. Thank okay. You. And so underneath that, underneath that memo, you'll see are actually, so we bill by matter. Yep. And so you'll see the names. Yep. yep. And so on what I put in the general category for purposes of this memo is, you know, FOA issues. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so under general, every time Tom calls me to talk about certain issues, uh, sometimes before they become a specific matter, so there sure. may be, there may be a, a contract to be reviewed, and it, we have a couple discussions about it, but it doesn't go anywhere. Um, anything I talk with Toady is in that general category. So is it? I mean, I guess I don't, I don't want to put two words in your mouth, but it's basically the general administration is kind of putting you as the gatekeeper, for example, to initiate the discussions and getting down into let's say. Uh, land use litigation, or even we'll say tax and finances, if it's bonds, that's on a separate billing, if you will. That's a separate attorney kind of coming in. And yeah, and it's okay. a little confusing. So this, this, these categories were just for purposes of yep. the memo, but we don't; okay. those aren't our actual billing categories. I get you. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So the way the way it generally would work is is I'll get a call, and mm -hmm. I can I handle I'd say seventy five percent of it at this point. Yep. And. Um, whether it's a general contract review or a town council issue, I, or I work on issues that come through you, um, any of the land use code enforcement, clerk's office, um, some of the legislative, things like that. If it gets to a point where it's like a complicated real estate, for example, I'll send it to my colleague, Pete Van Hamel, mm -hmm. and we may open a new matter for it mm -hmm. if it's discreet enough. If it's a general question, I actually know we have a general real estate matter, and we'll just yep. bill into that number. I got you. Okay. So that's the way it works. But I, I sort of make sure, and this is what I personally, how I fill this role is, as the quarterback, if you will, is mm -hmm. to say, even though I'm giving it to someone else to work on, I may, I'm, I'm sort of CC'd and copied on everything. I want to know what's going out. Sure. And then all the bills come through me. 
Okay. So that's the check for me at the end of the month too. Yep. Is I look at all the bills of all of our attorneys that's worked for you this month. I I look at them. If I think it's too high, I can mark it down. And Tom and I have actually done that a couple of times this time. We've had some conversations where we thought it was appropriate to mark some things down. Mm -hmm. That's what I do, and then I send the bill out under my name. And I think that's helpful to you too that you're having one person look at all that and understanding what's going on in the community. Yeah, on a monthly yeah. basis, and I'm pleased to show you a monthly bill just to be representative. But uh, they're detailed enough that I know who, 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 which lawyer spoke to who, which of my employees, yeah. what the matter was, and they billed to the tenth of an hour, as I recall. Yeah. So. I get a pretty good sense of what the issue is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Excellent. This helps. I. Well, no, go ahead. Do you have any questions? Go ahead. I, no, I'm done. I was just say thank you for coming in. Yeah. Um, Thanks for having me. I, I appreciate I, it. I, it's always good to, even if it's, I don't want to say formality because of the policy, but it's always good to kind of check in from time to time. And um, I guess the question I would have, um, you'd probably like to hear your client say this, but is there anything we can do? Um, you know, from our perspective to make the, uh, you know, make things a little easier or, or work better. It sounds like there's an extremely good working relationship uh, between your firm and the town. Um, but certainly if there's, if there's areas of opportunity or places where we can improve on things, that, you know, we're always welcoming that kind of feedback. Thank you. Yeah, we'll make yeah. sure to think that. Yeah. One thing I would just say is that, and I don't think it's probably not necessary to say in this case, but I always want to make sure our clients know that we want to know your feedback so we can do a better job for you so to not ever feel like you can't say okay you know actually we'd like it done a little bit more like this instead of like this and um you know in order for us to do a good job we need to have the real feedback so i mean you know whether you continue doing this policy exactly the way it is now um in the future or not um you know we really do want to do that and i think uh I think, Tom, over the years, there have been periodic opportunities to have sort of a discussion with you about, um, you know, getting some feedback from you, and, and we want to continue to do that. And Tom knows that he can, yeah. he, you know, the vast majority of this communication is going to happen with Phil or sure. may happen with Shauna. Sure. But if there's something that really goes wrong, he can always call the principal's office. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know. Well, I, I wasn't going to push it, but just from my personal perspective on the on the finance committee, Pat, if you could do something on the rates, that'd be great. That's, I know that's not a formal official position, so. <laughs> Let me give you a quick example. One of the things I admired about Chris Faniotis, I worked with him for uh, three or four uh -huh. years. He had a, a very unique ability. He was very succinct in his, in his yep. opinions, and yep. uh, even in his you know, conversations with him. Yep. More importantly, when he put something in writing, he got right to the point. Um, other attorneys have had a different style where they find the need to provide all the legal context and right. so on and so forth. And Phil and I had some conversations, and you, I really appreciate how you kind of you've adopted that same sort of right to the point yep. philosophy. Yep. Um, I think it, it, it's a value and use to elected officials to really get right to the bottom of it. Um, yep. Yep. There's a time and a place for all the legal context, but right. oftentimes it's let's give us your opinion and. Good. I appreciate you saying that, Tom. I, I, and, and Chris is really a mentor of mine. I think he's an excellent attorney, and uh, I still uh, look up to him. So I certainly uh, learned a lot from him. I remember Chris. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I will mention, um, just for the record, that, um, and it's not 100% confirmed yet, but because I, I want to give the chairman of the council, Bill Donovan, a chance to take care of that. But I think that there is a desire for this committee to ask for an executive session at a later date to talk about pending litigation just so that we can understand from a financial perspective how to plan for that properly. Um, so updates around that, which would be confidential, would be more appropriate for the full council to hear uh, regarding all of that. And so yeah, that would so be coming. Counselors who would benefit from uh, right. to appreciate the, the whole background right. to those taxes. Absolutely. So yeah, four years in now, or three years in now. Yeah. yeah. And, and and just for public, I mean, because we do get watched, believe it or not, um, we're not, um, I don't want to say we're harassed, but we're constantly reminded about the value of taxpayer dollars. And so when there's litigation out there, the first thing that is pointed out is you're spending taxpayer dollars to defend something, why don't you settle it? And there's value in pursuing what's right versus just simply settling it. And so from a financial perspective, we need to understand that in the budget as a whole. Sure. Plus, we have new counselors, so we'll bring that forward later. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank very, you. Very, yeah. very Thanks much. So much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
Um, as, a, as a matter of record, um, Chris, what I would like to actually recommend, because now that I've read the, um, and I'm going to read the policy, it's really short, because I do think that there's an action required of the Finance Committee. Mm -hmm. It says, um, and this was adopted in 2000, it says it will be the policy of the committee to evaluate legal services every three years and determine if, if an RFP is warranted. The Finance Committee will make a recommendation to the Town Council. So. I think that we need to forward something based on that we should forward something to the council um, and it's I'm going to move that um, the Finance Committee's recommendation is that an RFP is not warranted I'll second that so conversation questions for Tom no I mean I, I think you know for the record I, I think um, you know uh, rates are what they are I think they're probably uh, market rates for lack of a better word um, I, I it's a, really a question of uh, client attorney relationships I think are always key in these issues and, and a long-standing relationship is critical and, and it may <coughs> our hourly rate may be um, seen by some as rather lengthy but if it saves time in research and in background I think ultimately that's that's the benefit um, you know um, I, I would have no objection to to, to uh, not proceeding with an RFP at this point there's nothing that I've seen initially that would cause me to question that we're not getting good services or or reasonable rates, so I, I would yeah. have no reason to move for an RFP. Excellent. Um, I have, you've said it all. That's fine. <laughs> That's unusual. T take that opportunity. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. All in favor? Yeah. As to, so, Tom, if you can make sure however that needs to be done through the council, yeah. if it has to be an action item for them to, I don't know. Very well. Thank you. Yeah, obviously we share them the materials too as well. Yep. Tom, did you want that? Yeah. Because... Um, so we do have um, one other item um, before we get into some administrative pieces, and the last item on the agenda is our uh, is a discussion around uh, fund. Uh, let me make sure review and discussion on undesignated fund balance, and it's unaudited as of June thirtieth, two thousand and fifteen, and separate. Attachment. There was a the second attachment. Yeah. Right here. So we um, do have a slight update, so we're going to hand one out to you. Okay. Better. Perfect. Um, we're certainly pleased, and we'd love to have this start this conversation. I know Councillor Hayes is very interested in the matter, and it does occur to us as we look at this: the school and the town are intertwined when it comes to fund balance. And I might suggest this will be a, a, a you know a good discussion item with the joint committee as well. Uh, particularly as to how we're going to put this to use. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway. And what Ruth is passing out is um, benefited from Thank Thank Kate Bolton's input. Um, yeah. The numbers have slightly changed. We've also attached the so-called Statement 6 from the audit, which is uh, basically the Statement of Revenues, Expenditures, and Change in Fund Balance form. But this is still an audited, correct? Or it's still it's not finally approved, final for approval yet. It's right. still in the auditor's hands. Yeah. They're okay. finalizing pieces of that. Okay. Um, we're pretty darn confident. Yeah. I mean, for this purpose, I think it's. I think yeah. we're yeah. So remember, part of the complication is that this finance committee or former finance committee um, put in place a fund balance policy that uh, creates a number of uh, targets, if you will, in terms of percentage of total expenditures um, and so part of this analysis needs to respect and that policy does go on and explain how you calculate that because one of the problems was there's ten different ways to calculate fund balance so the policy prescribes for consistency how that's to be calculated year to year um, so this analysis is in keeping with and presented um, consistent with that policy and the policy is a matter of this committee could certainly take up if you wish to revisit that at some point. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll let Ruth introduce it. Um, Councillor Hayes had asked uh, some questions about fund balance. Um, so I thought, you know, um, that if we looked at Statement 6, for example, initially, it kind of gives an idea of what was budgeted for 50 fiscal 2015 what we actually spent or received and, and at year end um, it shows that the net change in overall fund balances was uh, 2.13 million if you will mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's an overview it's a you know 30,000 foot sky look at 
the different departments, what was collected, what was spent. So um, would you mind if I ask questions as we go along just to make so it, so the 2.013 million increase that is the net increase in the fund balance over last year total fund balance and that's both town and school combined correct okay yes but I will just flag for my purposes there's a number of things in here that that really kind of skew things such as capital improvements are in here and there's all sorts of reasons why we end this fiscal year no, I, I'm looking for where is the top line okay regardless of the cause and then we can get into cause okay. yeah Cause it, and just to kind of the reason why um, one to help me is that um, I think one of our standing problems in communicating to the community is that there is so much information presented in so many uh, ways that um, all of us, including me, can get lost. And so I just wanted to be able to take it one, so I, at least I understand it's 2.013, and we'll talk later about what the causes were. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that kind of gives like a, a high view of which departments were over, under, where our overall revenues, we don't break revenues out between town and school, it's just what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so we started the year with a total fund balance of 9.6 million. We ended it with an 11.7 million fund balance. So okay. now if we go to the second right here. set of spreadsheets. Okay, okay. sorry, right. yep. yep. So did you see where those yes, numbers came from? Yes, I found from? them, thank you. Based on the policy, what we do is we take a look at these various expenditure lines. We add them up, and that we, it's the budget number. So that's what we take. And the policy says that we won't go below 5%. Uh, our goal is 8.3. And if we exceed 10, we can use that additional 10, or I don't, might say we will use that extra 10 for capital needs. And the, I think we had sent this out earlier. In speaking with, <clears throat> excuse me, Kate Bolton from the school department, she had let me know that originally I had shown assigned school fund balance to be 675000 in fiscal. So at the end of 2015, that was money we were going to use to offset okay. the property tax rate in 2016. Sure. However, uh, 250000 of that amount was actually monies that were unspent from Wentworth so that we were going to then turn around and use those monies. But it's really not part of fund balance at that point in time. So that's why I made that adjustment. What it does do is it takes it out of assigned and it moves it up to restricted. The totals didn't change per se, but some of the calculations now will. So right now it's showing if you're on the second page it shows uh, the school's restricted fund balance at 540,000 it used to be 250,000 less the assigned school fund balance which is now 425 used to be 675 so that those are the two changes one went up one went down but the total school fund balance remained the same so um 2015 the restricted portion is 250 higher than what is was originally given to you the 540 is the is the correct number and then the, what is the 420 that's monies that we've set aside at oh, when we approved the 16 budget 2016 okay. budget we said we were going to use this much of the school's fund balance towards towards the budget it remains to be seen if that happens, but right now it's a sign so, that it can't be used for anything else. Yep. So, um, so that's where the increases came. So, the four. So there was four hundred twenty-five. Uh, I'm sorry. There's five hundred forty thousand dollars in surplus in the school budget that was not initially projected. Um. Because that's under the restricted. It's only restricted because we can only use it for school. Right. We can't okay. use it for anything else. So it's not, in, and we, we, as part of the fund balance policy, we said we would not include any restricted fund balance in our calculations. So they're excluded from those calculations. And but, just so I'm clear, though, use for school purposes also includes a reduction in their request, correct? 
You, you follow what I'm saying? So if, if their request is for, uh, uh, let's say, 42 million or something, we can reduce that by 540, reduce their request by 540. Is you, that accurate or not? You could keep it at the 42 million, for example, but yep. what it would do is it would reduce the use of pro uh, the, net, the reliance the on property the, Yes, taxes. yes, yep. right, right. Okay. So I, but I just want to be clear that it's not just meaning it, it has to, it's not just earmarked for school expenditures. It could be, it could be on the revenue side of things, correct? What it does is we show it as a revenue to offset the property taxes. Yes, right, revenues. okay. Yeah. And that's fairly standard. I mean, you no, recall I know. I, yeah. that uh, in a given year, there's almost always some level of fund balance on the school side that's that's part of the. the, the thing Correct. I, I just I bring that up more for clarification because I, I know some in the community were were thinking that the funds were not used for educational purposes by using them as a tax offset. Mm -hmm. They didn't see that correlation of reducing the request from the school. You know what I mean? It's it wasn't it was for the school's benefit. It just happened to go towards the request line. And then the other piece is that as uh, we have to remember, you know, from that sky high view is that we can turn around and say, oh, we're going to take all of this 540000 and use it in 2017's budget. However, it's a one-time revenue. Right. Essentially. Right. And once you use that up. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. And there's, you know, so you're looking, you've, you've built in a deficit for 2018, if you will. Right. So that's the piece. Mm -hmm. uh, that sometimes gets lost when we're getting down to that nitty gritty final number. The, yes, sir. Uh, the 425,000, is that also part of the fund balance that the school's carrying forward? Yes, their total fund balance was 965,000. Um, in 2015, the 425 that we're using for 216, in 2015, that number was 800,000. It just clicked, yeah. But they didn't use that full 800000 Actually, I don't think they used any of it. So the reason for the four twenty five is because they didn't need to use it, even though the budget called for it. So that's why it's retained. Well, the 800000 from last year. The four twenty five is it's in for, the sixteen budget. Right. It 16. remains to be seen whether they'll ever need it. Right. 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 So it, right now, it's off limits. It's assigned right. until audit, basically. Yeah. For but, example, but, if but it's still there. It, it still is, there. but for it's example, if, if, there's a, if there's a shortfall typically on the nutritional program, let's say, and it's 170000 Exactly. It'll come from that 425. Right. right. And, right. Any deficit will be draw right. against that. Any right. Yeah. And right. the nutrition program uh, also. Yes, but not necessarily. Sometimes they can do line item adjustments okay. internally to balance them off. But yes, to your point is if, if it's a major deficit, let's say, in a particular account, and it, they, it's not allowing them to do it, then they can take it out of the What might be helpful is just a quick conversation. If you look at this uh, statement six, the revenues is the top piece, and these mm -hmm. are big picture things, but uh, you'll see, and look at the far right column, mm -hmm. uh, the good news is those are all positives. So that means yep. in all those right. like five revenue categories, mm -hmm. we exceeded budget in revenues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, quickly on taxes, excise was 600 of that, 739, and we, we knew that. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so, so before we jump over there, because oh, I'm still trying to balance I'm this. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure why I'm uh, because of, I'll talk about that part later. So you 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 mentioned there's this eight hundred thousand dollars. There's no mention of eight hundred thousand dollars here. So there's the five forty that they didn't expect, but it's restricted because it's intended to be used by the schools. There's the four twenty five that's assigned because it was allocated as part of the twenty sixteen budget. They have yet to determine whether they need it. Correct. Right. But you mentioned 800000 so there's another $400,000. No, no. What it is is we created this yep. for last year. So last year this would have said 2014. Yep. At 2014, that, that number that's showing is 425 was 800000 That's now been folded into the, to these okay. other numbers. So, so the, the, the total um, on the first, the total assigned to the school is 965,251. That is the that's total. That's their, their that is total, their, that's total all, That's what I was trying to drive it. Okay. So, um, to your point regarding the revenue sources, as far as the overall, it is important to note that the total revenues exceeded um, projections by $1.8 million, which is very significant, and it's related to taxes excise taxes excise ta sorry the first column is excise it's it's every oh the first row is first property line. taxes excise taxes that's what i meant sorry yes. first yeah yep mm -hmm. um and then what's unclassified that's the second or just 
Unclassified uh, includes. Um, was that the bond the issue about the bond? We got a big premium the, back uh, on the bond. The, the bond premium is showing in the one above it, the three hundred and seventy-five. Oh, well, that's in the okay. It's, I just show it in there. Oh, okay. The unclassified could be anything from um, miscellaneous revenues. It could be charge for services. Okay. Uh, services. Rescue community services is in there. Uh, okay. Probably non-school educational subsidy monies is probably in there. The rest of the school revenues are probably in there too. So, um, so in that total revenue is the. That would not include anything on the school side. That's purely municipal. Oh no, this is and school so town at both. This includes both school and town. Remember, their revenue sources are pretty. Well, that's what I meant. Uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be so minuscule in comparison to the budget. So this is going to be predominantly town. Town. What affects the revenue? Yeah, if you side. looked at intergovernmental, that's probably yeah. the bulk of that is school. But beyond that, the revenues yeah, are 100, so yeah, yeah. locked down. Hundred thousand. That subsidy. makes sense. I mean, in their budget, yeah. the reason why I'm pointing it out is that there is going to be probably some mention or conversation around. Um, well, and we've talked about it, better projecting um, reserves or better projecting what the surpluses are and the sources of those so that they can be used in the current budget cycle. I mean, we tried last year, some did try. And what, the reason why I'm pointing that out is that that's not a discussion really for the school department or the school board, it's a discussion for the town based upon these revenue sources is how we might be better at project, make those, either making those projections if we're increasing our own revenues. Right. I, I it's will been targeted that the schools you know that they there um, and I, I don't want I'm not trying to call anybody out specifically but you know that there's this um, theory or there's this misnomer out there oh their budget is conservative they built in uh, built in excess expenses you know and it's just it's an intentional you know trying to push money forward every year when it looks like to me we need to be focusing on sources of revenue from the town side not school and not about expenses on the school the school's revenues are pretty limited. There's not yeah, much. From a revenue from, perspective. From right, a right, revenue right. perspective. From a revenue, okay. Right. The variation can And even on the expense, expense side, side, that's a different issue. Yeah. I, I did look at like three or four other communities in preparing some information and their financial statements. All of their revenues for uh, essentially excise taxes were well above any mm -hmm. projections they made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could say that it was just an anomaly in the town of Scarborough, but it, it's pretty much statewide. But the difference you might recall in the current budget, we jacked up excise revenue estimates Last with year the knowledge that you know we right. were at a different place. So I don't expect that trend of excess excise revenue continuing because I think we're much closer. Our budget figure is much closer to what we will ultimately get now. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's positive too. But I, I guess I'd like to look at from the unclassified perspective, that seems to be a catch-all for everything. And I know there's usually individual factors that play into that from a year-to-year -year basis. I'd be curious to know, trending-wise, if we are typically, you know, if there's an average five-year trend on, on unclassified, whether it's up, down, or neutral. This year may be an anomaly because we may be, you know, a few things may have played into it that caused it to be so, so far off. But if we're consistently, you know, several hundred thousands above projections, I think we'd be able to identify that in a trending type thing. Does that make sense? Once we have the final uh, mm -hmm. audit document, there is a, a further breakdown of these types of revenues. And okay. under unclassified, it does show all the various items. Uh, um, as Tom mentioned, I think community services kind of is a big one in that because, you know, they may budget for 30 students to take a program. Mm. If 60 students sign up, yeah. they don't turn those other 30 away. They take all 60 of them. So a lot of times their revenues are over because yeah. they've charged but them and their expenditures their are, right. are up. Yeah. Well, my yeah, hunch yeah. is beach revenue yeah. um, because I know we were trending and, and, uh, and finished strong in, in that yeah. regard. Um, I, I suspect beach revenue is probably the single biggest piece that contributes to that. And, and honestly, I'm not, I'm not overly concerned with a specific, you know, beach or right. community service. I think I'm, I'm looking more for the trending in that, that category, right. you know, because as you said, sometimes maybe it's a, you know, we had a, a lousy weather summer and beach revenues are way down because people just didn't go. I, I'd like to kind of see a, a general, that general category to see how we're projecting out, you know, where, whether so we're, yep. you we know, do do that. That. yeah. yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. So back to on, as far as the, the reserve fund itself. So, um, the other question I had before I got too far ahead is I was trying to reconcile the baseline for which we then calculate 5%, 8.3, and 10. You have 76,800, or not 76,000, 76,800,782 as of 2015. If I'm reading statement six, 
I'm showing that as to mean seventy six thousand seventy six million six hundred thousand three ninety five. Some of that has to do with um, the property tax assistance program. When we put some of this together, we look at it as an expenditure. When I do the audit, it's a negative revenue against property taxes. It's, it's a negative revenue. So that's part of the pieces. Um, some of it has to do where it's in under transfers out and overlay are considered expenditures. So they're, they're not in that total mm -hmm. expenditures number. They're in the transfer uh, other financing sources. Can you help me understand the difference between an expenditure and a, what did you call it, a revenue out? Negative revenue. Negative revenue. What's the, what's the, um, I, I know it's, it's, I'm sure it's an accounting issue. I'm just. It's an accounting thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Help, it's only, understand? there's only two real types. One is, uh, for example, this property tax assistance program. Mm -hmm. It's directly right off the revenues, property tax revenues. So we show it as a separate line as a negative, as a negative number under revenues. So. And again, this is just for my clarity. It, it's, it sounds like it's more of a processing issue. So if, let's say, a bill is $1,000, we don't collect the $1,000 and give them 200 back, let's say. We only collect 800 but we anticipated 1000 Is that how it works, no, or is it we, different? we gross okay. everything up. We would do the full 1000 and then. Yeah, they pay so, in full, and we re, it's a reimbursement. It is. So what would, why wouldn't that show up, then, as an expenditure instead of a revenue adjustment, I guess? Just, it's uh, like a contra account because it's interdepartmental. It's a account. It's, it's okay. a, you can't have contra accounts in the gap. For accounting. Yeah. Okay. So th that number is important because that's the basis from which she calculates how we how we compare against our policies. Right. The five, eight point three, and the ten percent. No. Okay. I just wanted to at least understand where that. Um, okay. So the number we should be looking at then is that seventy six million six hundred thousand. No. No. no it is eight. the seventy six million eight hundred. Seventy six eight. Because okay. if you look at the TIFs, there's $200,887 in TIFs. Um, somewhere buried in the public service are the credit enhancement agreements. So those are in the top See. number, but the yeah. TIFs are showing below and, and the under detail, transfers out. The 76 eight number is right in the middle of that second page. Chris, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. tie into that? Total one? operative, yeah. yep. I mean, I can tell you what the difference, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a, a reconciliation between the two numbers. That's okay. Um, no, that's fine. I just, it's I'm minor, just trying to understand. I just wanted to wrap my head around where it's yeah. coming from. So um, with that, then you break down on the page one. You give us the five percent, which is the minimum under policy. Um, it, it's a minimum that you should not go below. You can, and we have in the past. Eight point three is the preferred balance, which is equivalent to. Some people have asked. It's equivalent to, I believe, to one twelfth. One twelfth. One month. Of the months. operating one month's um, um, one month's payables, um, and then ten percent is the maximum before. The policy says that you will, um, I'd have to go back or should, use it towards capital needs um, as a cash payment to that rather than as financing. Um, so I understand that part. So when I go down to the, the one below that, so the question I have is um, the actual fund balance is 11702 correct? I'm sorry, I say 11,000, it's a million. Correct. 11 million 702. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you then take that amount and subtract out the 8.33% and that's what your excess point, access, uh, excess, excess is? Um, I'll have to reread the policy, but I think it all stems from your unrestricted. So it's based on the unrestricted. Which is the 8.2. Because then that's not so, and so the 8.2 is a subset of the um, fund balance beginning of a year. We start with the ending fund balance of the 11.7, and then we say, okay, we're not going to include restricted fund balance, so we back that out. Okay, when we back those that number out, it leaves us with the 8.2. And so you really have to take the restricted, so the 8.2 is the restricted amount is the, the unrestricted, unrestricted amount. amount. I'm sorry, the unrestricted, yeah. yes. And the detail, Sean, is on the second page, this yellow number. Yep. It's a combination of committed, assigned, okay. and unassigned town totals that number. Correct. 
And again, that's just consistent with the policy. That's not to say your policy is right. <laughs> but can be essentially, it's the, the non-spendable inventory, the first two items, it's not including that. Yeah, um, I'm just looking at the total. Is, is it also fair to say, though, that because the school hasn't calculated where they're at yet, that that whatever's remaining on the school will come down to below and increase that, that bottom number to give us a, a larger availability on the bottom line? No. Well, so if you look at the top, right now we've got 965, 251 for the school, a combination of restricted and assigned for the school. But that number is still, it's not, the 540 isn't done yet because we don't know where they're at at the end of the year. This fiscal year. This fiscal year. Correct. So if that number increases, let's say, to 550, then does that mean we add money to the uncommitted portion of it? Because it's, it's only committed yes. for this year. That 425 right. is only for this year. Right. So if we don't use it, it and, and you don't use any money in 2017 from the school's fund balance, and they came in exactly even, right. their fund balance for restricted would jump to 965,000. We'd move up to. Uh, so they would take yeah, that 425 and it would become restricted only for the school. Yeah. And actually, the yeah. 425 is only for the school also, but it's, yeah. it, what we're saying is we've already used that, so we're not going to let you use it again, essentially. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, you understand where I'm... Yeah. But we're using it to determine... The only piece I'm not following is the 540 and the restricted, because if they don't need any for the 2016, that 540 will transfer down to the, the, the amount below. No, actually, the Under amount the below balance. will transfer up. They'll have 965 to spend for general Just school, school purposes in 2017 but we'll have access to the, we it's won't have access year. to the 965 but in the budgeting process we could very similar to what we did this year I'm not suggesting that we do this but we have the option to say we'd like to use some of that for to reduce your requests and they usually do I mean the school department itself usually will make a recommendation they will to use that. yes they will the typically. question has always been how much correct and, yeah if correct. you ask Kate and Ruth right. Yeah, right. I mean, the, the, what are you going to They're good do stewards with, about it. It's always gonna say, mm, right. the difference sure. of opinion right. about how and why and right. so and, right. The only reason we break out okay. this 425 is 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 because of how we calculate yep. what we expect fund balance uh, what we want fund balance to be at. I mean, if we didn't have this designation or breakouts, we would probably use it on the full 11 million. Right. So no matter what, we're going to have $8.2 million in reserves that's eligible to be used. As long as... Outside of policy issues. As long as the school restricted balance doesn't change. That 540 doesn't change. It won't. It, it shouldn't. I know. It won't. Through until June 30, 2016. Then we'll have new number. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but that's, for, that's the analysis for the next, right. the next yeah, period. Yeah, 12 though. months from now. For, for yep. purposes of 17 right. budget, that yep. number is solid. So, and the $8.2 million dollars right. is equivalent to 10.7%. percent 82 million, yeah. Yes, which exceeds our maximum policy by 0.7%. No. It nine. exceeds the, 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 oh, the maximum, yes. Yeah. yeah. The maximum. 10 oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Ten point seven. So yeah. five hundred forty-one. That's yeah. the five hundred forty-one thousand. So the bottom line okay. is right. Right. the bottom line. After all this is said and done, we've got one point eight two one of available fund balance if we adhere to the eight point three percent guidelines. Is right. that fair? If we use any of that, that's going to change that five hundred forty-one thousand. But it won't because it's in yeah. this current year. This is based upon last year. Well, I mean, yeah, right. But so the next analysis, which is for six of two, will show any use of that. So yeah, I mean, it does get reported. It just won't be in this report. Right. So for planning purposes, I agree. You have one point eight, but it's going to it will be reduced by whatever you allocate as part of the next budget. Correct. No, actually, Correct. excuse me. Would that um, yeah? Because you've already reserved anything that was allocated in the current budget that we're in, because you don't want to use it. You want to make sure it's saved. Right. right. No matter what. So. Correct. <coughs> Is there, is there a history of use of fund balance? Okay, I get this now. There's a $1.8 million uh, amount in excess of the policy goal of 8.3%. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any perspective on whether that's little or a lot or how, mu how much of that would normally be 
uh, some or all of it would uh, be expected to be used? This is the first. Yeah. We might have had a little bit last year, like yeah. probably two, so three hundred maybe. This is, first this is the first year that we've actually exceeded the 8.3. In Ever? In, oh, no. No. well, within the, since the recession. Okay. In fiscal year 2010, the town council at the time consciously said we do not want to be to, to further the problem of the recession. Right. So they tipped into very sir. consciously used spent fund balance down to the 8.3 percent mm -hmm. and consequently kept taxes flat that that year. There was also a lot of belt tightening that went on at the school and some on the town side mm -hmm. at the same time to mm -hmm. keep that tax rate flat. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, ever since then, the town has not had has not budgeted and therefore not used fund balance. In fact, added to it, mm -hmm. and so uh, you might recall, and we'll provide this to you. But the auditor provided a real simple uh, graph that showed fund balance slowly gaining, mm -hmm. and so we're now to the point, and we should be very proud of the fact that we have rebuilt these reserves. So, though you're correct, 1.821 is available. That doesn't come without cost. Oh, absolutely. Bonding agencies correct. look. Uh, look down at, at, at so that's that takes us into the next stage which is that once we're able to um, understand this information and then communicate it is well how do we then drive policy around that as well as actions mm -hmm. um, because I can tell you that personally I would like to see the finance committee take up the, the reserve fund policy I'd like to talk to the bonding agents first um, which is our next month meeting mm -hmm. but I actually would like to see us revisit that policy um, I do remember when that policy was written because I was uh, a big part of writing that and it was because we were so low and we and this was back in early 2000s and so we even had we had to make the commitment that we wanted to build up the community and start doing this um, not just because of the bonding but it was also because of um, just moving in the right direction it was primarily a lot of it was around accrued liabilities not being reserved for and some management issues that are, I just differed in an opinion. So this is a great sign that after 10, 14 years we're in this spot. But I think that policy has to change in accordance with that to continue strengthening the community. And whether we go to a higher level, like there are some communities that have 15% as their policy, but you have to have the flexibility to be able to either exceed that as well as to sometimes dip into it when it's necessary. The bigger piece for me is that I hope this does not have a knee-jerk reaction in the community that we're going to then take $1.8 million, put it into the system, and whether that's education or the town, to me it's, it's, one, bu it's one budget because that isn't good management either and good, dis good action planning. So it feels good that year, but it's one time. It's one well, time. That's my, and that's my and point. The and the problems that are facing Scarborough right, right now, when you look at educational funding, isn't a one year. I mean, we're constantly dealing with it on a one year basis. It's a longer term, and I think that we need to look at this issue from a long term perspective, at least from planning, as a longer term issue. So, this is good news. Um, I do want to understand better what the sources of the $1.8 million are, or at least what the sources of this year's are, so that we can, one, give credit to where it's due, but two, understand from a planning perspective, you know, how can we shape some of our decisions to support them more. Um, and I think yeah. some of that is, is shown. Oh, absolutely. That's, that, that's why is yeah. Yeah. You need more detail to, to really understand a, a lot of it. But, you know, we knew we had a rough winter. We knew Public Works was going to come in a little high. In fact, they were 105,000 high. So, um, yeah, we'll provide, we can provide that for the details so you can really get mm. yeah. down and dirty I, I, and understand. I, again, from my perspective, I think it's always good to review the fund balance policy. I think the question becomes, again, when we start setting priorities of, you know, um, if everything is funded at the levels that we think are appropriate now, moving forward, that makes perfect sense to continue to build fund balance. The question becomes, do we take a, you know, how do we portion that up? Do we take fund, building fund balance as a priority over investing in other programs? And I think part is understanding that cycle of what's feeding that fund balance, where that, where that extra revenue or not excess revenue, for lack of a better word, is coming from, because that's what dumps into the fund balance, whether it's, I know on the school side of things, for example, if there's a line, a budget line item that's $50,000, let's say, and they only expenditure 46000 of it, that 4000 rolls into the, to the general fund. It doesn't mean that they have the option of moving that 4000 in another category within limits, but if they don't use it, it goes to the general fund again. So it's not just a question of increased tax revenues going into the coffer. It's also a, a function, I think, of efficiency of how you're operating as well. Is that fair? 
Yeah, the only distinction I would make is that I, I think it's better to look at use of fund balance really to reduce the tax rate as opposed to funding our funding operations. It's a, it's a slight nuance and it probably doesn't really, doesn't matter at the end of the day, but I, I think it's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. Well, well I mean, it's certainly the, something that's the final consideration, a, I guess, is my point. You go but through, even that statement, Tom, to be honest, the statement's kind of a shell game because you can sit there right. and put it into the budget and say it's reducing right. reducing the tax rate because of how you line item it. But right. then if you're increasing your expenses or increasing capital purchases, you're really just funding new programs or new well, investments. My so, other point is have your conversations, make your priorities, make your make your expenditure decisions first and then oh, absolutely. find a way to pay for them as opposed to yes. saying we'll do this program and we'll use fund balance to pay for it. Sure. That's sure in my mind not a good way to a healthy way to approach it. But you know and the good part is we have uh, um, you know seven members of the council that each might have a um, take on that as well as yeah, might I support either one of those because I'll be honest I actually have a very different approach in that while um, so I, it's irony that because we just had this conversation over coffee mm -hmm. Um, the Constitution, the original Constitution of the State of Maine says that surplus monies are supposed to be used to reduce taxes. And then over the years, amendments, amendments and laws and regulations have all changed the interpretation of that that has allowed surpluses can be, uh, can be maintained or, um, you know, uh, yeah, surpluses can be kept or, you know, fund balances and so forth. So things change. So, but I had someone actually, a former legislator, 20-year legislator, said, you know, the Constitution actually says all excess funds have to go back in and help reduce taxes. So it's how you would then interpret it. I personally would like to see a certain level of the excess fund balance go into restricted accounts for future planning that allows us to then pay for those one-time things so that you can then use the tax base to pay for new investments elsewhere so that you're not using it. So my quintessential argument lately has been in six years, I think it is seven years, we have a million and a half obligation to Eco Maine for a landfill closure. The question is, is that, you know, we should actually be capturing that revenue now because it's a closure for, for stuff that's going in there. So why not take $500,000 and put it into an account so that we can then don't have to put it into the tax base. So there's different theories and different methodologies and different kind of practicums that you can go around that. So it's all going to be, it's nice to be in this spot after 15 years. So, you know. Yeah, I, I think it, I, I mean, I think the discussion on fund balance is a, is a, is a um, it's a very complex one because yeah. I think the question is, is there, you know, if, if the, if the, the, if the expenditure side of things, if we're regulating expenditure side of things and programs are not, um, if, if some field programs are not being funded appropriately, yet you're running fund balances. I mean, that's, that's kind of the question of, is the money really working for the benefit us? The, is, is that really the best benefit of the town to build up that fund balance at the expense of other departments like public works, let's say, or something like that? Or is it better to say, let's get everything funded to the level that's predictable and sustainable first, and so that the, 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 the annual expenditure increases can be relatively reasonable and predictable as a general, I don't want to say cost of living type of example, but, but they can be manageable as opposed to having those giant fluctuations in expenditures. So we've also got, um, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, and I know, Tom, you've mentioned this a few times now, from the educational budgeting standpoint, we're almost to the point that we don't really need to, can't really rely or take into account the state funding. Mm -hmm. So is that, is, is from a philosophical standpoint, I know the, 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 Fund balance is a one-time transfer type thing, but if we're constantly running budget surpluses or we're constantly feeding money into the fund balance, which we should be, because it's always better to have that surplus than to be underfunded and, and run, run negatives. But if we're always feeding in a million or a million and a half every year consistently, then to me that would say, regardless of where that's coming from, that would say we need to look at are planning a little bit better on the front end side of things to say maybe we we should only be counting on 500,000 or 750 or whatever that number may be. So I think it's important to understand where the funding for the fund balance comes from right. and also then to determine okay if it's a, a series of one time events or unique circumstances then we need to keep that flexibility in the fund balance policy. If it's consistently that we're we're from whatever reason always going an extra 500,000 a year or 600,000 into that fund balance, 
I'm not saying utilize all of that, but maybe we take a, you know, some <clears> of that and reallocate that to the, to the general expenditure side of things so that we're not, we are building that account, but it's over a longer period of time, let's say, um, and that gives us a little bit but less. Let's be clear, we, yeah. you can't, as far as I know from legally, budget for fund balance. But fund balance yeah. is yeah. a derivative of experience. Your budget right. is your best estimate of what's gonna happen in the ensuing year. Yes. And you can look at history and get a sense of you know, where we typically end up, but there's yep. all sorts of reasons we end up there. Right. It's not always the same. On the school side, I suspect a lot of theirs has to do with the, um, the teachers leaving and Retirement. vacancies open. I mean, it's probably mostly payroll related. Yep. Uh, just things happen when you have 500 employees. I wouldn't be surprised if that's $300,000 um, one way or another every year comes through, through things that happen. Mm -hmm. I'm just throwing a number out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, on the town side, we could have an extremely bad weather, a uh, winter, like we did last year, that right. ran us in a deficit situation. Which, right. by the way, I was going to mention, to be $105,000, $106,000 in the deficit is pretty darn good, considering the circumstances of what we dealt with. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not uh, again, I, I'm not questioning or challenging the methodology of how we develop fund balance and what we do with it. I, I guess it's in my, we're, our goals are predictable and sustainable tax bases and expenditure bases. And if we're consistently contributing to fund balance, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting we use all of that money every mm -hmm. year up front. The 1.8 million is not a number that we should be taking into you know, up front. But if we're consistently, if we're consistently running um, higher fund, or, uh, consistently running more investment or more rollover into that fund balance, Maybe we do need to look at beefing up those operational expenditure budgets a little bit more um, in, in some other areas. Does that make sense? You know, so if we've got, if we've got 40 or $76 million in expenditure, $73,521 in expenditure, okay, and some of the budgets are running under, you know, maybe we should increase that to $78 million in expenditures because we'll still have that cushion in there for extras to go into fund balance it just might not be the one the 1.8 million It'll, it might be something less than that does that make sense not particularly but that's okay, okay. i mean uh, uh, this and i think it's no. my fault i'm just not no up. i'm sure i'm not I'm, there are some I'm going to put it in, in my s simple small head i think what you're saying is that we need to do better we we need to look at how we project revenues to capitalize more on those revenues in the existing budget. Because if we can consistently show that over time we have this large amount of surplus, then what we could do is increase programming expenses to support improved programs. Yes. Doesn't matter which one, and I'm not going to pick which one. Right. It could be education, it could be anything. Please, right. you know, I mean, because right. we, we've talked about, was it 24 um, additional staff? The fire department. So mm -hmm. you could pick which one. We're not being uh, right. particular to you. No, I understand that. Yeah, However, yeah. the challenge to that, and I, at least uh, what I would think, is that the reason that management and the town as a whole would want to take a slower approach than, and take a slow approach to that is that you don't know whether or not you're going to have a recessionary time or Correct. a volatile period in which all of a sudden those revenues draw, the excess revenues dry up and therefore your tax rate then skyrockets as a result of that type of planning. So I understand what you're saying and I, I want to have that conversation. I think that right. you're going to find we're all going to have um, differing opinions maybe or variable, uh, varying opinions on it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about where do we find the compromise that's in that. Right. I do want to go back to one piece. The reason why I'm happy about this fund balance because it does drive the secondary part of the concern I have for the current budget cycle. And that is, and it's not, um, um, it's a concern because it just, it's about the process. It's not really the money. Whether we lose 1.5, it's 1.6 million, I round up. It's 1.6 million dollars. If we lose that full amount, which is one outlier, or if we get 100% of it, which is another Education. very, very unlikely situation, this town needs to stop looking at educational funding from the state from a year-to-year -year basis and start looking at absorbing the impact of that volatility so that whatever revenues we get are the revenues that we get because we can't keep going back and fighting about and or discussing with the legislature their formula or the amount of money so that we're then kind of hanging on because I think that given the town's um, wealth, 
um, based upon at least property values. Um, it's performance, um, at least right now, we can absorb um, a leveled approach where we start saying maybe every year, you know what, let's automatically assume that our, our uh, funding is going to go down a million dollars. And let's plan that out over four years, five years, eventually so that um, we've absorbed that $5 million impact, whatever the time. And I, I need to understand whether we can do that or not because there's some legal issues about, and so, you know, Chris has kind of helped me understand that better. Because um, then whatever revenue comes in, revenue comes in, and we can then divert it or not divert it, put it where it's supposed to go and revert. You know, it's just a better planning model than simply going year to year to year. It's ridiculous what we're going through, especially a community like this. Will, come on up. Councilor Rowan. Um, so we're talking about fund balance, not educational fundings per se. No, I just wanted to inter interject because you were talking about it. it. We're close to becoming a minimum receiver. Right. Which means that we would not go down below. I think we have about $1.1 $1 .1 million left yep. before we become a minimum receiver. So that's. That's the limit of our. That's, there, that's if we. Current, who, who, are, who are the other minimum? Uh, York is one, right? There are a lot of minimum receivers. Other York, um, Wells, Gunquit. Um, I coastal a, a number of coastal communities up in northern Maine. So the bleeding is going to stop. So the volatility is going to stop. But my stop. point, though, is that but that takes into consideration the $1.6 million we could lose this year. Include that, yeah. So it's really almost $3 million. And then what I'm saying is that um, to get to that point, regardless of what happens with bills being submitted, um, appropriations, whatever, we need from a planning perspective to level that out so right. that we can calm our constituents and calm the community because we're planning for it over a three, four year period right. so that whatever happens, happens. And I, and I don't think that all of that solution is in fund balance, but I think right. a fund balance is an integral part of that discussion. And, and part oh. of the, in terms of, you know, trying to figure out what the state's going to do for their revenues, yeah. one of the things that we as finance people do is, or are asked to do by the governing governmental accounting people mm -hmm. is when we estimate our revenues, we're supposed to estimate them very conservatively. Mm -hmm. yep. Because, and we're supposed to estimate our appropriations as accurately as possible. Because what happens is, if I have a $100 bill, but I only have $60 in revenues, I can't pay the $100 bill. Right. Right. And it's easier to, so it's better to be conservative and have some excess coming exactly. in than to, right. than to estimate and it right the to the balance, penny. The money doesn't go away, it's available. It's, it's whether you're using it in the current year Correct. or it's available for use in future years. Right. And this gets to what is... Um, when is it raining and how hard does it need to be raining before you hit it? <laughs> right. Well, and then, and then what do you do with it while it's raining? Do you, right. you know, and, the, and for me, what I'm saying is that um, it might be better used to be put into restrictive accounts so that it then funds future long-term debt that doesn't need to be put into long-term debt or put into the tax base because we can use the tax base to then fund education at the greater level or fund public safety, which needs... 50, 40 employees, whatever, you know, whatever they might be. I'm not, I'm trying not to be specific to it. There, but there you know are what, you know some what communities, and I, I don't know if it's charter driven by their towns or what, but they might budget, pick a number, uh, planning vehicles. We only need one every four or five years, but they budget. So mm -hmm. if that's a $30,000 vehicle every year, they budget $5,000. They don't spend it in those first four years, but in that fifth year, and they carry it forward. In that fifth year, they have the money to buy the vehicle. It doesn't impact, you know, it doesn't do one of these things mm -hmm. to their to their budgets. And, right. and uh, so so that's a concept, too. But, you know, I don't know if that's something we can do or if it's driven by, you know, their town's charters. So, um, so I wanted to um, help, I guess, in asking. So now that I understand these two pieces, what I would like to see from a communication, um, I maybe for more for the public edification, but even to some extent, all of us, this first page, is a very good document. Um, if it included footnotes on how the values were derived, maybe, as a public document, this is a lot of information for the public to try to understand. Because as an example, I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm not saying withhold it, don't let them see it. I'm saying is that the basis of the discussion around fund balance should be just simply this one document. So in a footnote, if, I guess I'm gonna need a little bit more. So if I were going to put a footnote on how we came to that $76 million. I would put something like it does not equal the total expenditures based upon Statement 16 because it excludes negative revenues that are related to. Or it includes overlay and Overlays the and, other one. Yeah, whatever the net, you know, yeah. something like that to me would be the proper footnote. 
And then, you know, the others are all, pol you know, policy driven that the 5% mm -hmm. is based upon the, the policy X in which the minimum is okay. not to fall okay. below five, April, you know, you, you know, that type of stuff. Yep. Because then it, it, it explains it's. And then I think, um, you know, there needs to be a disclaimer on here that says that any allocation in the current year, one, um, it should indicate that any allocation in the current year that has not been used has been deducted from the balance because it's been committed. You see what I'm saying? So, so I think there's ways in which, I, I just want to clarify kind of how it's derived at because. So we um, could say of the 1.8 million, 425 was used in the 2016 budget. Right. Yeah. So the real total is 1.4 million. So, correct. So, you know, I, I, I mean, this is very useful. Um, the bottom line is it's positive information. It's very positive, and you know, for someone like me who's been here, this is um, incredible from where we've been. I mean, historically, from and we've never been a struggling town. We've been challenged by economic volatility, um, but we've always had. You know, first thing back in the old days, back, the first thing we did is we raided the fund balance because we didn't want to sit there and support um, an increase of X, even though the following year, it's only a one-time adjustment and it just gets put it back in the, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is, I think this is positive and it changes kind of the conversation, I hope, looking forward to policy. So um, we can talk about the policy itself because I, I really believe that it needs to change. The 8.33 needs to change. Maybe that becomes the minimum, the new minimum, rather than 5% and the maximum is 15. Well, I, I'd be curious to staff's opinion on that. I mean, right. one month, I would assume, I, mean, I know on the school side of things, that's, that's the insurance factor, if you will, for some catastrophic event should something happen. I mean, there are that's reasons. The yeah, there are reasons not to go below that. I mean, like, to me, the question is, the 10% is nice. Um, uh, well, it's, it's mandatory against state law, I guess. Um, the question is, what do we, is, is the, or is that oh, charter? That's, that's, char that's, that's charter. That's charter. Okay, excuse me. Well, no, it's t policy. policy. Oh, it's policy. It's, it's not, not even charter. charter. No. Okay. No, so the, the, the real driver is the bonding agencies. They, yeah. they right. view fund balance as a determinant of fiscal um, strength, strength, health, yeah. Yeah. security, and they're all about reducing risk. Sure. So the reality is, it's it's really those policies forced upon us. It's not state law. Um, it, it makes some intuitive sense. You need, yeah, that's like right. your household, you need some cushion for any well, I mean, day. But the bonding agents, is t there's really two types. One that likes reserves, the other one likes the, lending, the ability to borrow um, because they always believe, the, on the borrowing side, they believe you can always go out and borrow based upon future revenues. The other one is I'd rather have all the debt paid off, so why not have bigger balances? But at the end of the day, there's also a, an argument to be made. This is taxpayer money that right. not, is not, was not, and is not needed to run operations, and right. it ought to go back, recycle it back through, and reduce taxes. Yep. And then I know, I think it's probably since uh, Katrina back in, yep. you know, if something catastrophic happened, that gives us the ability to continue operations without any money coming in, because chances are, Correct. Nobody's going to be thinking about paying their property taxes if there's something catastrophic going on in town. So we right. need that backdrop, too, to, to keep us going. Uh, and there's some that say one month isn't going to do it, especially FEMA if we have to get health, FEMA. Yeah. How long did it take? Well, actually, my, my, honestly, Tom, my question was going to be, <laughs> I, I don't know if there are state mechanisms. I mean, I would assume for something that catastrophic to happen, it would have to be either a regional issue or even if it was a town issue, I would assume we could there are mechanisms in place to, I mean, town's not going to shut down and police aren't right. going to show up. It would be a, a disaster declaration. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, but there'll right. be a delay. I mean, of course. You might course. be a month or two months. Right. And then if we had to borrow by. money, right. we would need full, you know, council approval. Right, exactly. Prove it if there are emergency measures that. to be yeah, taken yeah, yeah, and that yeah. kind of yeah. stuff no, at that time. There's very practical reasons for maintaining yeah. some level of. Absolutely. Right. I, I, and I, but I think, again, I think it's important for us to, to explain that out, why that number's there, what that purpose, the purpose of that number is, why, what the, the, the uh, consequences would be for exceeding that number or going below that number? Yeah, I mean, the simplest way to rationalize it is think of your household budget. If you have the ability to have right. a month's pay in the, in, in the bank for the furnace blowing out or the car needs to be right. replaced, uh, if you have the ability to do it, you should do it. And well, people will understand the that. The unfortunate with that comparison is that, which goes into the whole housing market lending underwriting guidelines, is that 
it's more than one month's pay that you need to keep in reserves to be able to deal with a catastrophic proves, event, whether it's a boiler. Yeah, that it's usually point. six months We're to a year. We're just one month. We probably ought to have three months. Right. Well, that's a, that's a philosophy, right? I mean, yeah. how conservative that's a little, do we that's want to be? That's a little. That's a that's a little risky, conservative to me. Averse do we want to be? Two know? months, I think, is what Moody's. Just Fifteen. Yeah. Months, Moody's wants two months. Two months. Uh, what about the other bond agencies? Do they um, give you well, guidance? The only other one, I think they're pretty well okay with it, but they've even made comments about you know you're going to get into that level where you need to do something about your fund balance. Hopefully, this is I mean, getting it in double digits is a big deal. I mean, yeah. that, that they're they're they really pleased, like that. and we've shown that. That upward trend, which is very positive. Well, but then the question again, sorry, not to, no, no, not no, to no. beat this horse till it's, you know, laying there. Um, then the question becomes, uh, you know, we're using the bond agency ratings for bonding, mm -hmm. and do we want to start taking bonding issues with operational side of things because that's a better or capital? You know, we were talking about trying to shift capital out of the bonding cycle into the operational budget. So it's the question is, you know. It's a very dynamic question of sure. do we do we do we uh, increase fund balance at the expense potential expense of programs in order to appease the bonds so that we can get lower bonds so that we can borrow more money to run the programs or run capital or do we you know try and reduce our debt from a bond perspective and get the programs up and running? Well, that comes I, down. I mean, but that comes down to your debt schedule because it does. If I understand, and it's been a while since I've been in banking, but. The reason why they want more and more to be in the cash reserves depends upon also your debt schedule because as you borrow and borrow more, they want that cash to be there so you can have an immediate drop in your debt so that if you then have to go out and get new debt to be able to fund whatever your situation is, then you can. So there's a, it's, it's not really about the catastrophic situation. It's about how do you uh, liquidate or leverage your balance sheet um, a 10-year pay down. Uh, yeah, because they want to be, you sure. to then be in a situation where you can then get more favorable bonding to then fund future. It depends on the schedules that you've had, what, it, you know, are you doing everything. It's kind of like what the lawyers were talking about. You know, your five-year items, yes. are you bonding them for 15? Right, but they That's are. That's not a good situation. No, but they are. They can be counterproductive to each other. They, they have oh, uh, competing interests, I guess is my point. And that's why we're here, yeah. is to try and determine which interest we want to support and right. why and how. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll have that discussion, but we've got to communicate that effectively. Sure. I don't think the public has any idea of what the, the practical uh, uh, relevance is of increasing the amount of. Uh, I agree. Uh, and if it's being driven by, you know, the bond rating agencies, what sort of improvement in rates do you get? And, it, and is it any sort of so, so that's significant a good, amount of money? Actually, that's a good question. Because if you could take me, that, Tom. Well, it's maybe it's, the big, it's the, the big short well, in me, to be honest with you, no, but that I don't. Trust them. If it's a tenth of a percent on a thirty-eight million dollar issue, it so could it be could, big money over. Could you ask? So uh, for the public, so we're having this group conversation, but for, I forget we're being televised um, or recorded. Um, so for the public's um, uh, information, at the next meeting, which is in March, um, the finance committee is going to be taking uh, having a discussion like um, with the financial advisor around our bonds, mm -hmm. and that is on March 9th. And so maybe the question, if he could come prepared to show us what is the impact of the town from a financial perspective, if we either um, decrease our rating, um, you know, what is the financial impact and, you know, some of the sub su uh, subjective pieces, as well as what is um, if it improves it. Based on where we are today, yeah. you know, where would we be based upon maybe this year's yeah. current bond? Because request? those are bonds that are issued in the future. Right. right. Those are not, nothing right. to do right. with the $100 million worth of the bonds we have now. No one's increasing or decreasing Unless we the, face, the face value of that right. bond. Right. So uh, we're starting at zero. Yeah. So that's why I sometimes get concerned with how much could this possibly be? Hmm. Uh, well, he's the one that can answer that question. We can look at some recent yeah. issues and have them do what if it, uh, the rating was one, le one notch less? Yeah. Notch up and what if we were a, what a, a double A or an A1 or a triple A? Right, right. What and, would that rate be? And we took what the annual, has been, uh, annual funding amount has been uh, in recent years and said, okay, so year one, what does that cost us? Sure. Uh, year two, what does that cost us? Yeah, I think he could and reduce but, the amortization schedules, couldn't you, Rube? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it too technical. If he can just show annually if it went down one, if it went and do it over a five year period. Sure. 
What would, what, have, what would have it cost us more if it, we decreased it? What would it have saved us if it increased or improved? Um, the, uh, the other question I wanted to ask, if you could, Tom, for the bond agent, was um, if he could um, have a explanation of our current bond rating and maybe a history of where it's been for the past five years, um, and then where is that in comparison to a peer group? That's good. I think would be really important to understand but also, if part of that conversation is, because um, given his advice, um, if he can give the, not the advice, if he can get, educate us also around where the current town's debt is, and is that good or bad based on its current level? Because there, I know, um, I think it's uh, d and I can't remember who, one of them uses debt capitalization as their measure for rating, their primary measure for, I mean, they look at everything, but it's primary. You know, where are we in comparison? I know that there's this ratio, you know, the town of Scarborough is like, we could borrow up to $550 million, you know, some, some outrageous number. You know, where are we in, in you know, is that good? Is we're at $100 million, is that good? Is it bad? You know, and, and why? The big piece is why. It's going to, you know. Each, been each a, bond agency yeah. is going to rate things a little differently, though, aren't they? Oh, absolutely, but so, he can at least give us some... It's baseline to clients, but you can, a yeah, balance you can some analysis of comparative it. analysis I'm quite sure we're, we carry much higher debt than most um, yeah. but he can also give you some advice as to what it means in the big picture are we over yeah. leveraged in that regard do we have too much debt um, so I, I think you'll find him to be a wealth of information yeah. this is helpful we'll make sure he's prepared to answer these questions yep. Good. The, the other uh, qu and so we've kind of moved into that last item which is the discussion on future issues if he can also explain um, the whole bond the bonding not the bonding process yeah the, the bonding process and um, how the town bonds and what goes into that process because my understanding is there's really two types there is um, what they call standalone competitive bonding where you go out to the market on your own and then there is um, some type of state pool that you could go the into mutual bond bank. yeah the mutual bond bank and you know what does the town employ and then how are um, the big pieces how are um, what's the word issuance costs mitig um, kind of um, determined around those uh, because on a standalone where you go out on your own costs can be very different than what is in the pool Mutual bond pool. Yeah, so. what, well, what's your benefit? I mean, you have restrictions on the bond pool, how much you can and can't buy. Well, that's what I need. To, yeah. Because uh, then, what's the benefit of going out on your own if you get more favorable rates? I would assume with the pool, but again, I don't. Well, that's what that's what we don't know. That's yeah. what I wanted to understand. He's done samples, and it has shown that we've done better yeah. in the past anyway than we. Sale rather than with, negotiated through a bond. through the bond bank. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. So yeah. So then yeah. So if we go that. notwithstanding, I'm not sure if those yeah. would. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, just um, to close that out, our next meeting is March 9th. It's here in town council chambers. The primary conversation will be around um, the uh, meeting with the financial advisor regarding our bonding. Um, I d we do have a couple of uh, just a procedural matter. Um, if we could move approval, oh, there are none. There are no minutes, there's so no I don't minutes. need to worry about that. Nope. So um, any other questions for Tom or? No. So is okay. that the only thing we're really discussing next week, next month? Is at the, the at the moment, yes. Okay. Yep. I think that's going to be a rich I think that, discussion. So I think, though, uh, keep in mind and not to, uh, we, we've kind of, we being the council through our communications kind of goal is, um, so I don't want to become oversensitive, um, with the information that's coming out of Augusta around funding, um, things can change between now and then. Um, so, it, you know, there may be a need to have a beginning discussion around that we're going to bring that up obviously we need to uh, have a part of that with the joint finance committee meeting so uh, I didn't mean to cut council Rowan off before on that but we will have a more in-depth discussion around that uh, um, that minimal status is in future planning around it so it was useful to have that so do you want me to have any copies of this fund balance stuff for tomorrow if you could, uh, no if you could have a con no, um, I would wait on it um, if you could actually keep a copy for um, Councillor, uh, yeah, Councillor Hayes, along with the, the Bernstein Sure information, that would be great. You didn't want that front cover going to. Um, Tom, yeah, Tom, I'll, you know what? Um, as far as that front cover going to the Joint Committee, if you would, if you two want to talk to George and to Kate on the school department side, and if they're okay with it, I think. Um, we'll see if I'm personally okay with it. I we'll want to talk to Jody Shea. Yeah. Uh, 
I'd want to make sure Jody's okay with that so that she's not what would surprise yeah so and I'll talk to her about it just to make sure in the next 24 hours but yeah. okay, Kate can do her thing with the school finance yeah. too Kate she has should. a copy of, of this also really the joint discussion ought to be once we get further along in the budget process is the use of fund balance right yes right. that's right that's where it really needs to be but I think it's good to or start the planning. Yeah, it start the good news. Use implies that you're going to use it. Well, good, it's good to start the discussion of, you know, the good news is, is we're, we're projecting a surplus this year, uh, the, you know, then, you know, how much and what's available is the other discussion. Mm -hmm. I think. I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <coughs>